In stage 13, we are going to build on what we started in stage 12 and do some basic data mining in that recipe data set. The final goal? Be able to select the ingredients that will make the best predictors for which cuisine a recipe belongs to. Remember that in stage 12, we built the constructor for a recipe data class that's going to hold all of the information in our R file. And that constructor takes the name of the file as its parameter. We started reading in the R file. At this point, we've read the names of the ingredients and the names of the cuisines, and we know how many recipes are in the file. This is what our R file looks like, and we've already read this information into our recipe data class. The rest of the R file is the descriptions of all the recipes. Each line here is information about one recipe. The first part tells us whether it contains each ingredient. So, in the order in which the ingredients were given, this tells us the first recipe contains lettuce, doesn't contain olives, doesn't contain grape tomatoes, and so on, until the last one in the row tells us that it does contain eggs. Finally, the last thing the row tells us is the cuisine that recipe belongs to. Now this data is pretty trivial because it's a toy file to test our code with. The real file contains more than 16,000 recipes and 4,859 ingredients. Data mining is trying to learn from this data about how ingredients predict cuisine so that we can predict the cu cuisines of recipes that are not in our data set. For this lab, the challenge we're going to try to solve is figuring out which of those ingredients are valuable in making that prediction. That's the first step of data mining. As we parse the rest of the file, we'll store that information about the recipes in two arrays. We will have a two-dimensional rectangular array that will have one row for each recipe and one column for each ingredient. It'll be a Boolean array, where true means that the recipe contains that ingredient. Then, we'll store each recipe's cuisine in a one-dimensional array of strings indexed by recipe number. For the first part of this lab, we'll finish building the recipe data constructor to read in the rest of the file and build these two arrays. For the short.r file, this is what the two arrays look like. Recipe ingredients is the two-dimensional array. Its row index is the recipe number and its column index is the ingredient number. It is a direct mapping of the ones and zeros in the R file. The second array is an array of strings holding the cuisines for each recipe. While this is the way we usually draw that array, for this situation, I like to draw it vertically. This way, it shows that the index of recipe number is the same as the index for the rows of the two-dimensional array. So it's easy to see what ingredients this recipe has and see its cuisine name at the same time. Once we have all the data, the goal is to figure out which ingredients are most predictive of cuisine. In data mining, the values that you're using to make a prediction are called features, and picking the best ones is called feature selection. So we're going to build a class called feature selector to hold our feature selection algorithm. We're putting it in a separate class because this isn't really something the data should do. And in real life, it's likely that we'd want to play with a bunch of different strategies for selecting features. Keeping them in separate classes would make that easy. When we create our feature selector objects, we're going to give them an instance of recipe data to work on. In other words, the constructor for feature selector will take an instance of recipe data. To test our algorithm, we're going to need lots of different test cases. I don't really want to create separate R files for each case. If we do that, the details of the data are far away from the code for the test, and that's awkward at best. Instead, I'd like the test to build the various arrays that recipe data uses. In order to do that, we're going to create what is called a rigged constructor. A rigged constructor has parameters for each of the instance variables and is only used for testing. 
It makes it easy to create an object with specific characteristics so that the tests can be thorough. Before we go forward, let's think about what makes a good predictor in this situation. Suppose tomato sauce might be used in a lot of Italian recipes. Maybe a few Korean recipes, but not a lot of recipes of other cuisines. That would make it a good predictor. If we see tomato sauce, we might guess Italian with pretty good confidence. However, suppose salt is used in a lot of Italian recipes, but it's also used a lot in many different cuisines. Then salt is not a good predictor because seeing salt doesn't tell us much about which cuisines are likely. Mutual information is the term that is used for the idea in the previous slide. Two characteristics, for us, one ingredient and one cuisine, have high mutual information if one predicts the other. So tomato sauce and Italian had high mutual information, where salt and Italian had low mutual information. Data mining research has several ways of calculating mutual information, but we're going to use a simplified calculation based on the counts of recipes in which the presence of the ingredient matches the cuisine. For example, suppose that we want to calculate the mutual information between the ingredient flour and the Italian cuisine. In our data set, flour is ingredient number nine, so we're interested in this column in the recipe ingredients table. Let's start by looking at the recipes that are Italian. We want to count Italian recipes that contain flour. The second recipe, which is Italian, we do not have flour, so we do not count it. But the third recipe, which is also Italian, does have flour, so it adds to our mutual information count. When we look at the recipes that are not Italian, we want to count the ones that do not have flour, because that adds to our belief that flour implies Italian. So in the first recipe, we do not have flour, and it is not Italian, so we count it. The last recipe has flour, but is not Italian, so we don't count it. So in this case, the mutual information for flour and Italian is two. So at this point, we can calculate the mutual information between an ingredient and one cuisine. But we're looking for ingredients that are strong predictors across all cuisines. We'll call that total mutual information of an ingredient. We can calculate that by summing the mutual information of ingredients across all cuisines. In order to find the best predictors, the last thing we need to do is sort the ingredients by their total mutual information scores. Well, we already know how to sort. The only trick is that when we sort them, we need to keep the score with each ingredient. When we do the swaps in the sorts, we need the scores to stay with the ingredients. To do that, I created a class that holds an ingredient number and that ingredient's total mutual information score. As we calculate the total mutual information score for each ingredient, we'll build an array of these objects. Once we have that, we'll sort that array by comparing their total mutual information scores. Finding the best ingredients will be done by a method that takes a parameter for how many ingredients it wants you to find. After you complete the sort, just copy the best X ingredients into your results array. From there, anyone can use the ingredient number in each object to find the name of that ingredient, so we now know the top X ingredients. To make a runnable application for this, modify the runner that we built in stage 12. It took a file title and built a recipe data object from that file. Ask the user how many ingredients they want and use your feature selector to output the top ingredients. And if you're brave, I'll give you the real file and you can see what your code picks for the most predictive ingredients there.